Let's look at some other Catholic symbols. In this photo, notice the numerous symbols of the sun, moon and stars above the windows. Further evidence of sun worship can be found in the dome of St Peter's. Notice the sun at the centre of the dome through which sunlight comes. A little known fact is that Catholic churches are built so that worshippers stand facing the east. Although churches may arbitrarily face in any direction, the prevalence and consistency of this practice in Catholic churches suggests that they mean something specific by it. Just as the Jewish temple had worshippers facing to the west and the tabernacle likewise had its entrance on the east side, it is strange to find that this has been reversed. But then we read in Ezekiel 8, 14-16, he brought me to the north gate of the Lord's temple, and some women were sitting there, weeping for the god to moots. Have you seen this, he asked, but I will show you even more detestable sins than these. Then he brought me into the inner courtyard of the Lord's temple. At the entrance to the sanctuary, between the entry room and the bronze altar, there were about twenty-five men with their backs to the sanctuary of the Lord. They were facing east, bowing low to the ground, worshipping the sun. Catholic churches are built facing the east because it represents turning their backs to the Lord and instead worshipping the rising sun. Mass in Catholicism is something other than a simple remembrance of Christ's suffering on the cross as it was intended to be. The Church of Rome has perverted it into a reenactment of Christ's sacrifice. It is claimed that the Catholic priest literally sacrifices Christ each time on the altar for the sins of those present and those who have died. The idea is that Jesus' death and resurrection was not a once and for all act, but that they need to continually crucify him over and over to keep atoning for sins. Pope Pius X described it as follows. The Holy Mass is a prayer itself, even the highest prayer that exists. It is the sacrifice dedicated by our Redeemer on the cross and is repeated every day on the altar. The blasphemy of the Catholic Church is that they claim to kill Jesus every day through the ritual, causing him perpetual suffering. Nothing could be more obviously from the mind of Satan than this. It is also full of bowing, crossings and genuflections. This is a far cry from the practice of Jesus or the Apostles. Then there is the circular wafer, which again represents the sun. As it is held aloft, Catholics are encouraged to venerate or worship it. After being held aloft, it is then placed in the centre of something called a monstrance. These are a few types of monstrance. You will instantly recognise the solar and lunar imagery. By placing the wafer, representing the sun, on the lunar monstrance, you symbolically create a sexual joining of the male and female gods. You may also notice that this monstrance looks like the logo for the United Nations, and we'll get into that later. The joining of the sun and crescent moon in this way was prevalent in pagan cultures. In this example, which is a pagan Canaanite pillar, we see raised hands in praise of the sun disk within the crescent moon. In this next one we see an Egyptian statuette of an apis bull, which is one of the most complete representations of mystery Babylon religion there could ever be. We have the bull itself, which as we know represents Nimrod. We have the sun disk representing Tammuz. We have the crescent moon, which represents Semiramis, and the serpent representing Satan, all compiled into one statue. So this is the most evil statue that you could possibly imagine. In this final example, we see an ancient depiction of Isis, the Egyptian Asherah, the female goddess, with the same symbolism. She is holding her son to moots, then there is the sun disk on her head within the crescent. Often within sun disks, you'll see a face like this. Wherever you see a face within a sun, you are looking at a representation of Baal. Another feature of Catholicism is the crucifix. This is the image of Jesus still nailed to the cross, and only Catholics use it. Often depictions are far more graphic in their detail than this, and include blood and gore. This is linked with the blasphemous doctrine of the Mass, where Christ is continually sacrificed on the altar. By perpetually displaying Jesus on the cross, they are continually crucifying him. Another feature of such crosses can be the circle or sun image around the intersection, as shown here. It is particularly prevalent in what are now called Celtic crosses. Referring back to the previous part, you should notice that it creates the quartered circle symbol, which represents Asherah, and which is supposedly used to transmit the energy of the goddess. 
The idea of continual works or sacrifices to appease the gods and to earn your salvation is a pagan one and exists in all false religions. As it was once put very succinctly, every other religion says, do, 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 but Christianity is the only one that says, done. The sacrifice of Christ was a one-time only event that is completely sufficient for the atonement of sins. Jesus is now victorious over death and salvation comes by faith alone. Satan would rather see Jesus being perpetually and endlessly punished, however, and hence these continuing representations of Christ on the cross. Satan is clinging hopelessly to the past and enslaving humanity with works-based religion, which always either leads to feelings of pride or worthlessness, and both are as bad as each other. The Catholic idea of purgatory, where people spend a temporary period between heaven and hell being purified of their sins through punishment, again has no biblical basis whatsoever. It is entirely Babylonian. The idea of the halo, a circle of light or a sunburst around the head, is also a Catholic invention rooted in sun worship. Often when Mary is involved, the halo takes the form of a circle of stars, each one representing her demonic offspring. The name Vatican itself actually means the divining serpent and comes from the Latin vatis, which means diviner, and can, which means serpent. The word and act of celibacy comes from the name of a Roman pagan goddess, Chibel, and has no biblical basis whatsoever. The letters IHS are common in Catholicism, and although the official line is that they stand for Isus, Homonym Salvator, which means Jesus, the Saviour of men, it also happens to be the initials for an Egyptian form of the unholy trinity, Isis, Horus and Seb. Now this one may seem like pure conjecture, but another key point that we'll go into later is that in occultism there is always a double explanation for symbols like these. There is always a false, seemingly light and good meaning and a true but dark meaning. The sunburst surrounding the letters gives the game away a little in this particular symbol. There is in fact no need for me to highlight individual examples, as many notable Catholics are fairly candid about their adoption of paganism. For example, in the Externals of the Catholic Church by John F. Sullivan we read, It is interesting to note how often our church has availed herself of practices which were in common use among pagans. Thus it is true in a certain sense that some Catholic rites and ceremonies are a reproduction of those pagan creeds. In the story of Catholicism on page 37 we read, It has often been charged that Catholicism is overlaid with many pagan incrustations. Catholicism is ready to accept that accusation and even to make it her boast. The great god Pan is not really dead, he is baptised. Now Pan is listed in the Satanic Bible as the horned god and is one of the infernal names of Satan. Obviously Satan cannot be baptised. Cardinal Newman, who was recently given sainthood by the Catholic Church, admits in his book that the use of temples and these dedicated to particular saints and ornamented on occasions with branches of trees, incense, lamps and candles, votive offerings on recovery from illness, holy water, asylums, holy days and seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, the ring in marriage, turning to the east, images at a later date, perhaps the ecclesiastical chant and the Kyrie Elysian are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the church. In the Faith of Our Fathers by Cardinal Gibbons we read, The penetration of the religion of Babylon became so general and well known that Rome was called the New Babylon. In Life of Constantine by Eusebius we read, in order to attach to Christianity great attraction in the eyes of the nobility, the priests adopted the outer garments and adornments which were used in pagan cults. In Religious Tradition and Myth by Dr. Edwin Goodenough we read, The church did everything it could to stamp out such pagan rites, but had to capitulate and allow the rites to continue with only the name of the local deity changed to some Christian saint's name. But we can find many other examples if we choose. We sometimes see the Pope and other members of the Catholic clergy wearing Saturno hats, for example, and this is in honour of the god Saturn. Most other times priests wear mitre hats, and these are connected to Dagon, another type of Babylonian god. Here's a depiction of Dagon alongside the Pope with his mitre. Here you may also see that the Pope is holding a staff called the Twisted Cross. 
Roman Catholic author Piers Compton writes about it in his book, saying, The twisted cross is a sinister symbol used by Satanists in the 6th century that had been revived at the time of Vatican II. This was a bent or broken cross on which was displayed a repulsive and distorted figure of Christ, which the black magicians and sorcerers of the Middle Ages had made use of to represent the biblical term Mark of the Beast. Yet not only Paul VI, but his successors, the two John Pauls, carried that object and held it up to be revered by the crowds, who had not the slightest idea that it stood for Antichrist. So the staff being held in the Pope's hand is an open representation of the Antichrist, but only if you are initiated with the knowledge to really see that. This is the nature of the occult, things that are in the open but whose true meanings are concealed. This was never more true than in March 2000 when Pope John Paul II preached an updated Sermon on the Mount at the altar of Chorazim in Israel. Here he sat under an inverted cross, one of the most potent and disgusting symbols of Satanism and black magic, under the pretense that it represents Peter, who was crucified upside down. Once more he holds up the twisted cross depicting the Antichrist for the adoration of the crowd right in front of it. Behind them all is a Christ-like mural displaying the words that he is coming soon, but as we'll discover later, this character for who they wait is in fact the Antichrist. These pictures represent perfect examples of how occult symbolism always has two meanings, a false public and acceptable front, and then a true hidden meaning behind it. This is another common symbol of Catholicism, the XP or the Chi Rho. The false and light explanation is that it represents Christ, as the first two letters in Christ's name are X and P in Greek. Now this is an extremely tenuous link at the best of times, but Albert Pike in the Freemason handbook Morals and Dogma reveals the true origin of this symbol. The active and passive principles of the universe were commonly symbolized by the generative parts of man and woman. The Indian lingam was the union of both, as were the boat and mast and the point within a circle, all of which expressed the same philosophical idea as to the union of the two great causes of nature which concur, one actively and the other passively, in the generation of all beings. What he's basically saying is that it's another expression of the point within the circle we looked at earlier. It represents sexual union. Then there is the Vatican's crest. This is clearly a serpent or dragon which is the symbol for Satan himself. Just a couple more to finish. In Rome, there was a male god called Janus, who had a female partner called Chibel, from which we get the word celibacy. Chibel was always depicted wearing a tower as a crown, which was on account of her being the first to erect towers in cities, and this helps identify her as Samiramis under a new name. Janus was always depicted as carrying a key, because he was considered to be the grand mediator between heaven and earth. He was worshipped as the god of doors and hinges, and was called the grand opener and shutter, meaning the door of heaven would not be open to your prayers unless you first invoked Janus. The worship of Janus prevailed in Asia Minor at the same time the Lord commanded John to write in Revelation. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens no one can shut, and what he shuts no one can open. God is specifically proclaiming here that he is the Lord and the one true God who alone opens and shuts the door of heaven, not Janus or Chibel or any equivalent. As the head of the mysteries on earth, the supreme pontiff held similar keys which were symbolic of his spiritual and earthly authority, hence the image of the two keys on the shield. One key is gold representing the power to bind and loose in heaven, while the other is silver symbolizing the power to bind and loose on earth. The Supreme Pontiff was therefore given the name, the Interpreter, because he was the link between heaven and earth. In Chaldee, the original language of the mysteries, the word Interpreter becomes Peter. Thus we see how the keys of Janus and Chibel would become known as the keys of Peter. And this is the origin of the unbiblical myth perpetuated by Catholics that the biblical Peter is waiting at the gates to heaven, ready to admit or turn away individuals who would seek to enter. It simply comes down to a bit of wordplay with the Chaldean word for interpreter. The repetition of Hail Marys as a mantra to absolve yourself of sins is also from paganism. Jesus warned about it when he said, When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. In later times, the popes would arrogantly claim to be infallible, something that is true only of God. 
By setting themselves up as gods, they, like Nimrod, consolidated their power by claiming to have spiritual and divine authority as well as political authority. Do your own explorations and you will find a lot more that give the game away. I've spent so long in Catholicism because it's important we realise that Babylonian mysteries are not some ancient belief system that died way back in the mists of time. The Babylonian religion is alive and well today, in this case disgustingly and confusingly wrapped in a cloak of Christianity. Christians are often confused about how we should relate to Catholicism, and many see it as a legitimate form of Christianity, and there are ecumenical movements today that are capitalising on that ignorance. Many Christians feel like they have to apologise for the Crusades and the Inquisitions, even though true Christians were often the ones on the receiving end of those, as we shall soon see. Catholicism is the largest religion in the world. So we've established so far that there are just two roots for all world religions and belief systems. The first root comes from Nimrod, Babylon, and behind it is Satan. The second root comes from Israel, the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the two competing kingdoms in this world, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Now some people, particularly Muslims themselves, would have you believe that Islam belongs to the second route, that it shares its origins with Judeo-Christianity and is something of a continuation of those faiths, that Islam is the last and true revelation of the Judeo-Christian God to his people. Even some Christians have been deceived into thinking that the word Allah is just an Arabic word for the Christian God, Yahweh, and that we are connected somehow. While we can't go through every religion one by one to show the links to Babylon, it's worth taking a little time to study Islam because of its prevalence on the world stage right now. So what I intend to do in this part is briefly show that Islam finds its roots in Babylon. The beginnings of Islam go back to Muhammad, who was born in 570 AD in Mecca, and who is revered in Islam as the last great prophet of God, usurping the authority and preeminence of Moses, Elijah, and even Jesus himself. Because religions tend to assume the character of their founding figure, this is the best place to start in understanding Islam. The Muslims have one holy book called the Quran, and several other volumes called Hadith, which are oral traditions relating to the words and deeds of Muhammad. Hadiths are considered important tools for determining the Muslim way of life. Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim are thought to be particularly authoritative. According to the Hadith of Bukhari, Muhammad used to retire to a cave alone where he would spend long periods of time, several days, praying to Allah. It was in the cave that he experienced an encounter with an angel who apparently gave him a revelation from God. The angel asked him to read some writing, whereupon he replied that he couldn't read. Muhammad was illiterate. The angel then pressed upon him with such force and in such a way that he felt like he was going to die. Clearly it was a distressing experience. Upon returning to his wife Kadiha, he is reported to have been terrified, indeed his neck muscles twitching with terror, and convinced that he had encountered something satanic. Now his wife Kadiha had a Roman Catholic cousin called Waraka. Kadiha ran to Waraka to report this experience to him to see if he had any insight from his Catholic religion. In response, Waraka wrongly referenced Moses as receiving revelations from the angel Gabriel in this manner and suggested this could have been what had happened to Muhammad. The angel Gabriel is in fact only mentioned in the Bible four times, twice in Daniel and twice in Luke, and never in relation to Moses. After hearing about this, however, Muhammad's mind was changed about who he had just had an encounter with. He began to think of himself as a prophet who had been visited by an angel of God. As a result of this experience, however, Muhammad became suicidal and attempted to kill himself on multiple occasions. He had two main periods of suicidal thinking where he began attempting to throw himself from mountains in a bid to find relief from mental torture. I said to myself, your humble servant is either a poet or a madman, but Quraysh shall never say this of me. I shall take myself to a mountain crag, hurl myself down from it, kill myself and find relief in that way. The second period of suicidal thoughts came when these visitations ceased. The inspiration ceased to come to the messenger of God for a while and he was deeply grieved. He began to go to the tops of mountain crags in order to fling himself from them. 
From these passages that show Muhammad's suicidal mental state, it seems clear he was visited not by an angel, but by a demon or possibly Satan himself, as Muhammad himself had first suspected. Now visitations from angels who give people a different message were foreseen by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians. There we read, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. The cave experience was not the first time Muhammad had been in contact with something demonic. He apparently had a strange but undefined experience as a child, after which his carer became convinced he had been possessed by a demon. Further evidence for potential demonic possession comes even within the Quran. In Surah 81.22-25 and Surah 69.41-42, people claim that Muhammad was inspired by the devil and something of a madman. Further evidence of Muhammad's mental disturbance is to be found in the Hadith of Bukhari, Volume 7 and Number 660. For a whole year, he was so bewitched and befuddled that he thought he was having sexual relations with his wives when he wasn't. This is a strange scenario which can realistically only have two explanations. Either mental illness caused him to hallucinate, or he had some kind of sexual encounters with demonic entities. Either way, Muhammad was clearly disturbed. At one point in time, Muhammad admitted that Satan had put words in his mouth to compromise with pagan idol worship. These words have become known as the Satanic Verses. He later changed his mind on the issue, but it shows that he was unable to distinguish the source of his revelation. Another politically incorrect but equally true assertion is that he was a paedophile, marrying his wife Aisha when she was six years old and consummating the relationship when she was only nine. Muhammad was over 50 years old at the time. All kinds of arguments have been put forward in an attempt to excuse this behaviour. Muhammad, in fact, had over 20 wives in his lifetime, while hypocritically restricting his own followers to just four. One of his followers says, I embraced Islam while I had eight wives, so I mentioned it to the Prophet. The Prophet said, Select four of them. Muhammad himself was so filled with insatiable lusts and sexual desire that he would have relations with all of his wives in one night. Anas bin Malik said, the Prophet used to visit all his wives in a round during the day and night, and there were eleven in number. I asked Anas, had the Prophet the strength for it? Anas replied, we used to say that the Prophet was given the strength of thirty men. And now we can understand a little why Muslims are promised constant fornication with virgins in their paradise. It reflects the character of their Prophet. In this we also see similarities with the prominence of sexuality in occultism. Finally, as we look for links to Babylon, it should also be noted that Muhammad's visitations came in caves. As we noted way back at the start of the study, Babylonian worship, particularly relating to Nebo, happened in caves and was common practice in the mysteries.